Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's Making More From Sheep webinar. Tonight we're going to be looking at reproductive problems in ewes, specifically uh, ewe diseases uh, affecting fertility and trace element issues affecting fertility. Now, uh, we're having a hiatus from the uh, webinars next week and returning the week following with a webinar from Phil Graham, and that's going to be on uh, what, what's your best investment in the pastures uh, this coming year. So great webinar. We're going to have a break next week and, and the week following on the Wednesday night at 8 o'clock we're going to have a webinar with Phil Graham on the best investment in the pastures for the year ahead, whether it be lime, uh, fertiliser, pasture renovation or establishing new pasture. So we'll just have a look now quickly at the uh, uh, webinar platform for our new registrants this evening. Now on the webinar platform you'll see, yeah, we might just go forward one side there, yep, if we have a look there we can see, you uh, We you, you can hear us but we can't actually hear you. Now you're going to see that control panel represented there on the left uh, Now it's going to be on the top right of your screen, just uh, collapse it or reinstate it with the use of that red button there. Now that question box is all important. Uh, Bruce has kindly uh, kindly agreed to stick around tonight to answer as many questions as he can um, on this topic. So as the webinar progresses, just drop your questions in that box there. We might ask for a few people to put a comment in there now at the moment. Tell us what the weather is and you're doing in your part of the world or anything, uh, if there's any cricket scores that we should know about. Uh, because it's good that we know that you know where the box is and, uh, and it also means that uh, I know that you can hear me. So just moving on to the Making More From Sheep uh, program itself. Now if you just type into any Google search Making More From Sheep or even MMFS, uh, the first hit will be the Making More From Sheep website. Now this is an excellent website, it's a joint initiative of AWI and MLA. There's a, a range of resources in there. If you go straight to that modules drop down box, you'll see that there's uh, a range of modules there relating to you know, sheep businesses. And if you go into each of those modules, you'll find a wealth of knowledge um, and resources and even tools for sheep producers to, to access to help answer the, you know, the, the questions arising as they progress in their, um, in their businesses. So moving on to tonight, presenter. Tonight's presenter is Bruce Allworth. Now Bruce graduated from Vet Science in Sydney Uni in 1984 and after that he worked at Massey University in New Zealand. Bruce has worked on the McKinnon Project and has owned and operated his own beef and sheep consultancy business based in southern New South Wales and Victoria for 25 years. Now currently uh, Associate Professor of Ruminant Health and Production at Wagga's Charles Sturt University. Bruce is operating his own family farm in Holbrook with approximately 10,000 sheep and 900 cattle. Uh, with that in mind, there's no, uh, there are few better uh, situated to deliver tonight's webinar. So with that, I'd like to introduce Bruce to the webinar. Good evening, Bruce. Uh, thanks very much, uh, David. Good evening to everyone out there. Um, I've given a couple of these webinars. Uh, tonight we're on reproductive problems, and I think David's given me a pretty tough um, job tonight so I'll do my very best and I'm hoping you'll come in with um, questions that are relevant to you. The reason it's a little bit difficult is that I recently gave a webinar on joining body weight and uh, ram, ram soundness and they're the most important things, the joining management, um, the fact that the rams are right and the body weight of the ewes are the really critical things to, to joining. The things about reproduction that we're talking tonight are generally the secondary problems, but in any specific flock they can be a, a real issue and that's why David wanted me to just touch on some of these. But I'm aware that for a lot of you, you might have only experienced one or two of these issues and so other of the issues that I'll be talking about may not be as relevant. So I will try and keep my presentation reasonably short and sharp and then I look forward to any questions. And the questions can be on things I've covered and equally if you think there's areas um, that I haven't covered that you want to hear about, don't hesitate to um, shoot in a question and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I'm happy to talk in the questions on perinatal lamb mortality. 
Um, but that's really a topic on its own. Um, it's one of the major issues that we have in the, the sheep industry uh, and I won't be discussing that specifically tonight but if you've got a question on that afterwards I'm sure we can address it. So I'll be briefly looking at clover disease and um, certainly looking at Campylobacter and Toxoplasmosis and a few of the other diseases that we know about and just tracing on the touch, uh, tracing on the, touching on the trace elements. Um, mainly iodine and I'll also mention selenium and possibly copper. Um, so I'm going to try and touch on the uh, common issues but if you can line your questions up it'll make it much more relevant for you. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping for most of you um, this is no longer an issue. Um, clover disease um, was quite prevalent back in the 70s um, and even into the 80s. Um, with the oestrogenic clovers um, that were originally released um, Dwalgan up and Dinny up. Um, Yarloop was probably the most common in the area that I'm familiar with um, and we still occasionally see problems with them. There are two separate syndromes with clover disease and they're not actually related. The first is a temporary infertility which occurs when you um, graze sheep on green clover um, and that clover is oestrogenic and those ewes will become infertile um, the changes occur that stop the semen uh, going through the cervix and it takes about three weeks from removal from that oestrogenic pasture for those sheep to recover. So it generally occurs um, with spring joinings. There's a, a more serious condition and I haven't seen this now for quite a while which is a progressive condition which leads to permanent infertility. And in flocks with permanent infertility, you tend to see a decreasing fertility in, with age um, and it's reasonably easy to diagnose because there are permanent changes both in the uterus and in the cervix of the sheep. Interestingly, um, I've actually on, on one of these pastures, I've uh, squirted a colleague in the face with milk from a weather. So that's how much oestrogen can be in these pastures, enough to make a, met, a, a weather um, produce milk that you can put your hand round the teat and squirt it out and have a cup of tea. So it used to be a problem but hopefully with all the newer varieties um, most people won't be seeing um, that problem um, nearly as much now. I, th I think in terms of reproductive um, problems and diseases Campylobacter would be the number one issue we'd be concerned about across Australia, probably across all regions. Um, I understand from some sam sampling there appears to be, uh, it's less common up in the New England um, and I have no idea why and I have no idea whether that information is accurate. Um, it's a, a cause of, of, of abortion and also of weak or, or dead lambs. And I guess from a producer point of view, the main things are what are the risk factors, what might you be doing on your farm that might increase the risk. The, the important thing is, as I've got on the point three here, is that this, when this organism is present in a mob, it actually lives in the sheep's gastrointestinal tract. So it's an enormous normal inhabitant and it's present in the faeces. So what happens is wherever you create situations where you get very heavy stocking rates such as occurs in mob stocking situations, um, very common in New Zealand where they had quite a few problems with it with the type of mob stocking that they do there. Um, you, can, you can get the, um, you're more likely to see a problem. And the other problem that's more relevant in Australia is if you're autumn lambing and you're hand feeding, particularly where you're hand feeding in the same spot each day. Uh, rather than changing the spot where you're trail feeding. Both of those situations can lead to situations where the ewes are ingesting more faeces than, than they would normally ingest and those faeces can be contaminated with the Campylobacter bugs and that then can cause a problem. The other issue that's been identified is that birds who scavenge um, aborted fetuses actually come infected themselves and continue to shed and spread the organism. Um, so that's also one of the, the issues with the spread of it. Incidentally, and probably not too important in this case, it does cause um, gastro in people, gastroenteritis in people, although the specific strain of Campylobacter, to my knowledge, 
um, is not often identified and it may not be associated with these specific abortion strains. There are two main strains that cause abortion. Um, this is probably too much detail, but, but one is called Campylobacter fetus fetus and it's been commonly known for a while. And the other one, which appears more commonly to be found in Tasmania is um, Campylobacter jejuni, and that's the one that's more likely to be also associated with gastroenteritis. There is now a vaccine available. Um, it's around about $1.10 XGST uh, a dose, and so if you give two dose to uh, maidens, that would be $2.20 for that um, program. There was some work in, there was some um, reports in New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand they've been using a Campylobacter vaccine for a number of years now, and there were some reports in the early 2000s that flocks that did not have any problems with Campylobacter and used the vaccine increased their lambing rates by about 9 or 10 percent. Uh, so what we did was we set up a trial and we selected six flocks in the in the Holbrook region that to the best of the owner's uh, knowledge, they hadn't had any specific outbreaks with um, Campylobacter. We did have one person um, who put themselves forward for the trial, but then we subsequently found that there had been an outbreak, so we took them out. So these six producers, um, to the best of their knowledge, didn't think that Campylobacter was a problem in their flock, and we took 500 uh, mostly very young or young ewes, and we vaccinated 250 of them twice, six weeks apart, and we also left 250 sheep untreated. We grazed them together from scanning until lamb marking, um, and the, the results are in the table. Only on one of those six properties did we get a significant advantage from vaccination. Um, so that's the only information I have on this in the Australian situation. Fortunately or unfortunately, as happens with trials, the year we did it was a particularly good year. So there was certainly no hand feeding going on and stocking rates were relatively low um, relative to the amount of pasture production that was produced and that may or may not have influenced the results, um, but I just um, note that. So. I guess that the main question is, given that the vaccine's available, uh, given the price of lambs at the moment, uh, should I be vaccinating? How do I work out whether I should vaccinate and are there, there blood tests? There is actually a blood test, but it's not widely used and there are no reports on how it is best to be used. And at this stage, it's only been used by um, the Coopers personnel uh, in uh, investigating some issues um, around the use of the vaccine. So it's not very simple at this stage to go and test your flock and really know what's going on. I guess the, the, if you just look at the cost of it, for each 100 maidens it would cost you $220 to do the two doses. If there was a possibility of saving three lambs, depending what you, you break even on the lambs are, if your lambs um, that you're producing are worth $50, then it'd be four or five lambs. If they're $80, it'd be less than three lambs, would be your break-even point. Um, and what I'm mostly suggesting is that as a very, um, as a starting point and possibly as an end point, that producers consider at least vaccinating their maiden sheep twice. Whether you continue to then annual, annually vaccinate the adult sheep subsequently, um, no work at all has been done on that, but it would seem reasonably prudent given all the information to certainly think about um, vaccinating the maidens. The recommendation is to vaccinate them prior to joining, at least two doses three weeks apart, um, but you can certainly do one dose before joining and one dose after joining. So I'm, ha I'm happy to take questions afterwards on Campylobacter. Uh, the, the probably, um, and possibly the most common, although we don't often see outbreaks with toxoplasmosis, is this um, second important cause of abortion, which is toxoplasmosis. Um, and most of you know a bit about toxo. It's um, mostly spread by cats. And so what happens is the, the cats um, eat the, uh, are in, around the sheds, they eat the rodents that are in around the, um, uh, the grain, 
um, and the cats then uh, amplify the toxoplasmosis and its shed in their faeces and that will contaminate their feed. There's also some concern over feral cats and some recent work uh, from the University of Adelaide suggested that areas with high levels of feral cats also had high levels of toxoplasmosis. It generally results in um, a late abortion um, but not at the level that Campylobacter has. With Campylobacter we might see 15 to 20 percent of sheep aborting. With Toxo in most cases um, we only see a, a much smaller percentage of animals of ewes aborting. Um, and the classic is when you look at the um, uh, placenta that the cotyledons are very engorged and enlarged. Um, I did see something um, that said that 50 grams of cat faeces could infect 250,000 sheep. That seemed pretty impressive to me. I think they worked out that if you spread 50 gram of faeces in a silo um, of 10 tonnes, then you would infect about 25 sheep. Um, so it certainly, I guess the take home message is if you've got an issue with cats, uh, you're doing a fair bit of hand feeding uh, to late pregnant ewes, um, then you need to be a little bit careful. And um, one of the ways that you can overcome that apart from getting rid of the cats is also to control the, um, uh, the rodents. Uh, just quickly mentioning a couple of the other um, problems that we see. Listeriosis is a reasonably uncommon problem um, in Australia and it's usually associated with feeding of silage. And in my experience, there's not a lot of silage uh, relatively fed to uh, late pregnant ewes and that might explain it. Um, I, should have, I should have pointed out with Toxo and it's also true with Listeria, both of those are um, zoonotic which means people can catch them. Uh, the most with Toxo, people generally catch Toxo from dealing with cats and it's particularly, uh, it's not a serious disease unless it affects a pregnant woman. Um, and then they can have similar problems to the problems we see in sheep. There, there is also um, the potential um, uh, infection of people with uncooked meat um, with Toxo. Um, and similarly with Listeria it can have quite severe effects uh, on people so you do have to be fairly uh, careful if you're dealing with any, my, my recommendation would anyone dealing with aborted fetuses should have very good hygiene. Uh, the one I haven't listed on this um, group because I don't see it causing too much of a problem is Q fever, but it will certainly cause um, people to get fever and to be quite sick. And in fact, we vaccinate all our students on arrival here at CSU for Q fever um, if they haven't had prior exposure to it. So we see that as pretty important. Back on to causes of reproductive problems. Salmonella um, will certainly cause um, abortions but it's reasonably easily diagnosed. It's really the only one that the ewes also get very sick with. Um, with the other ones, no doubt the abortion's uncomfortable but the ewes are running around um, and it doesn't generally affect the ewes health other than losing the lamb. With salmonella, the ewes generally get very sick as well and while some of them might just abort, others will be dying whereas that's not the picture you see with, with um, the other causes. Sheep, like cattle, can also get pestivirus. Um, we're not going to talk tonight about pestivirus. Given how common it is in cattle, it's surprising that it's not particularly common in sheep. And it's generally considered to be a slightly different strain um, in Australia that uh, affects lambs, although crossover is possible. The other thing that I suspect you're all very well aware of um, that can occasionally cause abortion is brucella ovis. But surprisingly, given its importance, it's not particularly um, important as a cause either of abortion in sheep it, and it doesn't actually survive for very long in ewes. So if rams are infected, that will affect the reproduction. But it, there's very little ewe to ewe transmission. It's ewe to ram back to the ewe. The ram is usually involved. And um, if, if rams are affected, they're generally affected over a long period, whereas ewes generally self-cure after two to three months and are then immune. So it's not usually an ongoing problem in the ewe flock. It's certainly something 
um, that you need to consider if you're having fertility problems with your rams. Uh, I'd just like to uh, mention probably um, an unusual one, but I guess if a few of you have been on farms for more than 20 years, over those years, one of those years, you've possibly seen goiter in lambs. It's usually in the odd lamb very obvious with a very, very large lump uh, under their neck, which is their thyroid, um, which grows enormously in response to low iodine because they're trying to desperately uh, make thyroxin um, to look after themselves. It's generally in higher country and in higher rainfall country. Um, and it occurs in very good years where there's a very good autumn and particularly over wet winters because the rain apparently uh, leaches the iodine down into the soil profile and there's less available for the sheep. The other thing is that in drought years you rarely see it because the grazing of soils results in quite a high accidental iodine uptake and rarely it's a problem. You can also get what's considered to be induced um, iodine deficiency where there are substances in both white clover and some of the brassicas that actually um, interfere um, with the um, uptake of um, iodine and produce a goiter. Um, so you can see it specifically on white clover and brassicas but also in very good years. I incidentally, the, one of the things that thyroxins are very important for is regulating the heat of the lamb. Uh, as you're probably aware, cold stress is a major issue anyway at lambing time, so anything that makes that even more likely uh, can be a real problem. So one of the things you'll see is not only the large um, uh, necks with, with the, the, the thyroids in them, um, but you'll also see, on, particularly on colder days, increased losses from these lambs, not all of which will necessarily have enlarged, uh, obviously enlarged thyroids. Um, that can't cope with the cold weather. Uh, it is reasonably easy to um, uh, overcome the problem. The difficulty, which is simply to treat the ewes um, with a potassium iodine solution in the, in the fourth month of pregnancy, um, preferably. The difficulty is, because it's such a sporadic occurrence, um, is knowing whether or not you need to be doing it. And generally, um, uh, except in uh, places where they regularly get it uh, up on a couple of highland um, properties that I'm aware of, most people would um, see, particularly in the maiden news, and interestingly I've seen it probably more commonly in Pole Dorset sheep, uh, the first one or two lambs might be born with goiter and then the producer will quickly go in and drench the rest of the um, sheep with the um, potassium iodine and that usually overcomes the, the problem uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, it's hard not to mention um, selenium because wherever you look at reproduction problems in sheep or cattle, selenium always comes up. Um, to my knowledge, there's no good evidence that selenium is associated with a fertility problem in sheep. There have been a number of reports in New South Wales. Um, there's been a number of investigations in Victoria which have, have said it doesn't cause a problem in specifically um, Cattle, I think there's probably been about 50 papers that say that there is a problem and 50 papers that say there isn't a problem. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It seems as though Bruce has gone offline there. Now, Bruce, can you hear me? I I think that we may have lost you. Look, uh, if people can hear me there, I appreciate I've lost Bruce as well. Now, just stay with us and we'll try and get him back online. Just give me one second here, please.
Has that brought me back? Rightio, something's gone wrong with my headset. I've just taken my headset off so it might be quite as clear. Sorry, everyone. Whereabouts did we get up to there? Yeah, Bruce, I've got you there. Dave. Yep. yep. You might just yep. have to go Dave. back. Where, where? Go back one slide, I think. Uh, no, did, no. You did were, we finish goiter? Yeah, we finished goiter and we were about halfway through selenium when we lost you. Okay, so I guess what I was saying was the main thing is that the drenches these days all contain selenium, so it's really not much of a problem. The, um, and if I've missed something there on selenium, please let me know, because uh, I'm not sure what I've said and what I haven't said. Um, the other issue is copper, um, but what I was saying about copper was you need to be very careful about treating sheep with copper because you can certainly poison sheep by giving them too much copper. Um, and that can lead to dramatic deaths. Um, but again, neither selenium nor copper um, are strongly associated with reproductive problems. If you had somebody out on your property and they were concerned about your selenium status, I'd certainly be addressing it, but I wouldn't expect that your fertility uh, would improve dramatically. And equally, if you had a fertility problem, I'd be very surprised if the additional selenium made the difference to the fertility problem. So I should keep that on the screen so I can see that I'm still, you're still hearing me, yes you are. So if we just go now, I'm really keen to uh, finish up so we can get on to some questions. I, I guess just to sum up, um, I think given current prices and given the availability of now a capital back to vaccine and given that it's hard to assess flocks, I would be consider at least vaccinating maidens twice with the Campylobacter vaccine. I would certainly be encouraging producers to investigate the cause of abortions. Um, if you get an aborted fetus, um, it's a matter of getting that examined properly at a laboratory um, to see what the cause is, and that can be very useful. As I said right at the beginning, I haven't talked about it tonight, but it would be remiss not to remind us that new body weight, ram soundness and joining management are what are the main things that will be determining the fertility in your flock or the, the changes in fertility in your flock, apart from obviously the, the genotype that you've got. Um, Iodine is probably the only specific trace element where we see reproductive problems, but I think it's important that you understand your trace element status. Unfortunately, there is a lot of sales uh, pictures about trace elements and trace elements are the magic bullet if you live in a deficient area. If you live in a sufficient area and you give sheep uh, selenium or cobalt, uh, or cobalt, it just goes out in their urine um, if they don't need it. So um, if you're wanting to pay for something to go out in the urine, that's well and good. And if you give them copper and they don't need it, you can actually kill them. So you really do need to know what's going on with the trace elements. And the other thing to, to reinforce is that infectious problems that we've been talking about generally occur in wet conditions and with very high stocking densities. So that's just to try and give you a heads up for the sort of season where you're expecting to see a problem um, and to explain to you why you might see a problem one year and not other years. So on that note, and my apologies, I'll drop it out there shortly. Um, let's head to questions on what either I've talked about or what you'd like to talk about. Great. Thanks, Bruce. No worries there at all. Look, um, I want to commend you on getting back online so quick. There was a bit of a minor mishap there, but um, no dramas at all. Look, now we've got a, a moment to give Bruce a break. I just want to flag that on March the 15th, uh, the week following next, we've got that webinar on pasture. Uh, whether your best investment, your best bang for your buck is going to come from lime, fertiliser, pasture renovations or, or uh, establishing new pastures. Now, we've got Phil Graham on board for that. Phil's done a lot of work in this area and he's a, he's a, he's a straight talker and I'm, I'm looking forward to that one immensely. And on March the 22nd, we've got a, a webinar for those who are in particular concerned about their wool and that's on wool quality faults and the, the uh, price discounts that we're, we're seeing in the market at the moment. We're going to try and estimate whether those, wool, uh, those current discounts uh, are here to stay and you know how they look in comparative to the um, you know, historic data set. So this is your chance to, to give Bruce a few questions. Bruce has kindly agreed to stay online for as long as we need to answer them. Bruce is a big source of knowledge, great source of knowledge and 
and um, I'd like to encourage everyone to jot a few questions down now. Before we commence those questions, if you do want to leave, I appreciate that and you want to get on with your night now, uh, make sure you contribute to the survey at the end. I'm noticing that I'm having trouble uh, cracking any more than um, you know, uh, uh, 70 to 100 participants at these webinars. So if anyone's got a suggestion around maybe timing of the webinar, we've been running them at 8 o'clock on the strength of past surveys, uh, suggesting that most people think 8 o'clock is the best time, but I know it's not the best time for everyone. So if I get an overwhelming response to run them in the middle of the day, then I'll, I'll consider that. And also, if, um, if people here think that if they're a worthwhile activity, and they've got friends or family, associates that you know may not know about them, please don't be scared to let them know. They can jump online um, or forward them one of the emails so they can register for the, uh, for the opportunity. So it's your levies in action and we want to make sure that as many people are getting the option to attend as possible. Now with that, Bruce, we've got a few questions coming through here. Yep. I'll just, just add to that, David, Phil is an absolutely dynamic speaker, so that'll, I'll be surprised if you don't crack your 100 for Phil. He's well worthwhile listening to. Oh, great. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, and I, um, yeah I'm looking forward to it myself. I've had a good chat to him about his topic area, and um, he's well across, the, well across it, and he's got some good data as well to back up his, um, back up his recommendations. So I've got a few questions coming in here. Um, now, Bruce, there's a first question to kick us off tonight is from Nick. Nick asks, what ages do you give the two injections to the maidens for the Campylobacter? Yeah, and, and that's a good question, um, Nick. And also, I didn't specify what, what I was meaning by maidens. Um, and there might be quite a few listeners there that are um, joining their use at um, one year old. So the age that you're giving it is... Um, prior to joining, it actually says on the packet you can give the doses three weeks apart and it actually suggests you give it three weeks before joining then on the point of joining, but equally you can give it at joining and immediately you take the rams out and that would be fine as well. The minimum interval is three weeks. Um, you can certainly do the second dose um, much later than the three weeks and still get effective immunity. With all vaccinations, all two-shot vaccinations, the immunity occurs about a week after the second vaccination. We find that with Campylobacter, most of the infections occur from about day 90, um, between about day 85 and day 90 in um, pregnancy, and then it takes about two to three weeks for the abortion to occur. So provided the ewes um, have solid immunity from that vaccination, around that um, three-month mark, then you, you should have as solid protection. Great. Right, right, thank you, Bruce. Bruce, quick uh, question here from Dan. Dan asks, do you recommend farm workers to be vaccinated against Q fever? Um, and, unfortunately, Dan, I'm a, um, I'm a vet, and so I'm not actually qualified to make any recommendations. How's this for getting out of the question, David? I'm, I'm not allowed to make any recommendations on what's good for people. Um, but what I would uh, strongly suggest you to uh, do is um, have, a, have a look at, about it. Farm workers are at risk, particularly if they're dealing with um, anything to do with fetuses, um, if they're uh, in some way um, looking at animals that are, that are pregnant. I mean, the, the worst thing that can happen on a sheep farm is uh, well, the most likely thing to happen is you get the odd sheep with preg tox coming up to lambing and somebody says, well, I'll just check its preg tox, I'll see if it's got twins and a fatty liver and opens it up. Um, and if they're only doing it ad hoc, they're not used to the fact that they need to put gloves on and, and be fairly hygienic about it and that would lead to exposure. I guess if the farm workers are only peripherally involved with animals, it's not very, it's not as much. Abattoir workers and vets would be at the highest risk because vets are usually called out when there are uh, 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 problems and are regularly examining um, pregnant animals, uh, both cattle and sheep. So that's what the, the main risk is. Right, uh, thank does you. that answer the question, Dan? Hopefully it does. Oh. Uh, the other thing I should say on Q fever, having said I'm not qualified to say anything, it, it is important that you seek um, uh, medical input about whether or not you should be vaccinated because if you've actually been heavily exposed then you can get a reaction from the vaccination. 
So what the doctors normally do is my understanding is they test you to see whether you're naive or, or you're at risk to it. If you are, you're vaccinated. But in some cases they might say, look, you've already been exposed at some stage and we won't be able to vaccinate you. That's my understanding. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, uh, more of a comment here that you may be able to um, provide some insight on. And we, uh, one of our participants tonight definitely has goiter and they're in the upper Murray with a spring lambing system. Now, this particular participant would like to have uh, Flexidine available in Australia. It says the Kiwis are using Flexidine at tupping and uh, they're saying that they're getting better fertility rates. Uh, eight months of slow release iodine. Are you familiar with that, Bruce? Um, I'm not familiar with that particular one. When I worked in New Zealand, we used Lepiodol, uh, which was also a slow release uh, iodine. They've, they've got a lot more iron deficient areas, iodine deficient areas um, than, than we have, and they've always had a lot more access to uh, trace elements than we have. Uh, we, we had access to Lepiodol in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, I think, and then it went off the market in Australia. And at the moment, um, I'd be interested in um, what the, how the participant is treating their sheep. It's quite hard to get hold of potassium iodide. Um, when I need it, I go to a chemist and, and um, get some and then, then make up a, um, a mixture with a, a formula I've got. So it's not an off-the-shelf product that you can go and get like it is in New Zealand, and that is difficult for those people dealing with iodine. But I'm certainly happy if somebody wanted to contact me, I could tell them what they need to treat it with. But obviously somebody who's dealing with it each year would just treat the sheep in the fourth month of pregnancy um, if they're doing something else. The reason we say the fourth month is the fifth month's getting a bit close for handling the sheep, and it will certainly um, overcome the, the problem for around about two months, which is when they're at risk. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. There's a question here from Katrina. We may need a little bit more uh, context from Katrina, maybe her location, but let's go with it. We have had uh, month-old lambs that seem fine one day to the next day they are dead. They were grazing loosen at the time. This was happening about two months ago, so that puts us back in, uh, back in January. Now, that was from Katrina. Uh, I, I guess... Um I'm clutching at straws here, Katrina, but there's there's a couple of things. Um, it's surprising um, that you're getting sudden death in month-old lambs associated with the pastures they're grazing because they're only just starting to graze at that stage, depending how well the ewes are milking and what sort of ewes they are. The most, I, assuming the ewes were vaccinated pre-lambing with at least a five-in-one or a six-in-one vaccine, that should cover them for pulpy kidney. If they weren't vaccinated, I, that's exactly the age that you first see pulpy kidney, and that would be the number one thing. The other issue with lucin in um, with lambs, although they tend to be a little bit older, um, is a condition called red gut, where um, just as it sounds like the gut turns red because it gets a torsion in it. It is a very acute disease, as is pulpy kidney, and they're indistinguishable if you're looking at the animals because they both die very suddenly. And I'm talking here two to three hours, not half a day or anything. Um, they're alive and then you, you come back an hour or two later and they're, they're just with their feet up. Um, so that's, a, and if the lambs are fitting well, it's going to have nothing to do with anything that's happened to them um, in terms of reproduction. It's going to be most likely one of those two things. There are a number of other conditions, but all of the other conditions tend to be less acute. The two really acute conditions in young lambs are any of the clostridials, but specifically pulpy kidney, and this condition, red gut, although my experience would be normally a little bit older. Interestingly, if it's red gut, there's two recommendations. One is um, um, to add some roughage into the system. Hey, that sounds a great recommendation, but my my um, experience is that sheep grazing on loose and aren't particularly interested in rough hay. The other one, uh, which came out of New Zealand by, by um, down in Lincoln when they first discovered it, was they suggested we make uh, we turn sheep into union sheep, and that is that they have five days on loose and, and two days off and that two days off is generally enough to stop the outbreaks occurring. There is one uh, uh, loosened producer um, north of Wagga 
that has told me that even that he still has troubles with, but in my experience that's usually reasonably successful. So I hope I haven't been too politically incorrect there, David, with my union sheep. No, I think I think that's fine, Bruce. And just to add a little bit more context to that, I, I just looked down my questions here that are coming in chronological order and Katrina asked one down the list a little bit and she, she made a comment here. We've also had ewes that are away from the mob and walking around in circles staring at the sky. I don't know if that's got... Okay, the, 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 two, the, the two things, the, the classic one for, for that is a disease which has a great name, um, which is called polioencephalomalacia. And the ewes are circling and, and what's called stargazing. And that's actually easily treated, believe it or not, with a thiamine injection. Um, unfortunately, by the time you get to the U, if it's too progressed, they don't often um, get back to normal. But if you treat them quite early with that condition, um, with a shot of vitamin B1, they respond um, uh, very well. It's usually in well-fed uh, animals, often um, not dissimilar to the issues that come with pulpy kidney due to a change in the gut or substances which actually take the thiamine out of the, the, um, their absorption. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility would be, but if they're on loose, and I can't imagine they'd have anything to do with silage, but listeriosis causes exactly the same uh, type of problem, but without the stargazing. So with listeriosis, um, circling is the most common uh, presentation of listeriosis. So. Um, that may or may not be helpful. I guess the only thing I can say from afar, which is easy to say but not particularly helpful, is when you get these things, um, if you really want to know, it's usually reasonably straightforward to diagnose some of these things. So you just need to get professional help on those. Oh yeah, thanks, Bruce. No, that's 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 uh, that's good information and uh, can lead them in the right direction. Now, quick question here from Damien uh, with regard to the sheep pestivirus. What what is he hairy shaker? So, so what, what hairy shaker is, is, is a lamb that is born that has been infected with pestivirus with its mother in uterus. It's survived, um, but it's got nervous conditions and it's got abnormal uh, hair growth. So the lamb appears hairier than a normal lamb and it will be shaking repeatedly. Um, they're, they're very obvious. Of course, with any disease outcome, you always get a range um, of, of um, symptoms. It's never just exactly the same in every individual. Um, but it's fairly um, obvious in these ones and they really shake and they have a little future in life, these lambs. Okay, great. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, a question here from Dan again. I think it's a good question. At what point in gestation does the Campylobacter cause the abortion? So what a point during gesta uh, gestation? So, so that the abortion actually occurs uh, from about day 120 onwards, um, depending when the ewes got infected. Um, I guess the, the query I always have, and I, I haven't got a satisfactory answer, is with some of these diseases like Campylobacter, are there abortions occurring, occurring earlier, which we don't see because there's no signs at all and we just end up with the extra dry ewe? And I can't answer that question. But the investigations that we do into abortions, um, they generally occur in the last six weeks because that's when the lamb's big enough to see. So um, that's, and um, given that, that's been very well documented with Campylobacter. With uh, something like um, uh, Brucella ovis, we see occasional abortions but much more an infertility around joining time. We don't seem to see that with Campylobacter and there have been a lot of investigations of um, infertility around joining time, and I just would have thought, given it's, it's reasonably common, if that was a common occurrence with it, it would have occurred. So I generally consider Campylobacter to be a late-term abortion um, presentation. Okay, good. Thanks. That's great, Bruce. Now, I just want to make a comment there. Let's give you a, a, a rest for a second, Bruce. Um, there's a few sort of... Uh, a shorter questions coming through here. If you if you do have a good question, make sure you provide uh, provide me with plenty of context and and spell it out um, the best you can. Otherwise, it comes down to my interpretation of what you're writing there, and I, I just want to make sure that I get the uh, the right question 
to Bruce so you get the right answer. So just uh, keep that in mind if, when you're typing your questions in there. Bruce, uh, Dan, thanks you very much for answering his questions. And he made a mention there that he's asking the questions because many of our lambing fatalities are full term stillbirths. So that's that's the uh, yeah. that's why he asked those questions. Yeah, well, that, that that's a really good point, Dan, because um, the the vast majority of issues at at lambing time is this perinatal lamb mortality, which I've skipped around tonight, and that there, there are two main causes associated with this, which is very easy to tell you what they are. What's very difficult to do is tell us tell you how to stop it. But one is the obvious one, which is birthing birthing problems or dystocia, which is more common, surprisingly, in single lambs because they generally um, actually grow the lambs too big in the last six weeks um, and then they can get stuck. Obviously, twins can also get stuck with twisted legs and, and um, the ewe being a bit down in condition. But we see dystochia as a distinct group. And then the other big group, um, which is our real nightmare, is this uh, starvation mismothering exposure and that's the, the production of lambs which are either of normal weight or slightly lower weight on a normal or below average day um, with a mother that is average to below average. And when you combine all those things, we end up losing too many lambs. And that's a, a, that's a, a, a topic probably that David could run a, a webinar at some stage. The difficulty with the webinar is we don't have really good answers for you to go away and and reduce those losses from 20% down to 5% or less, which is what we'd all like to do. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Now, we did run some lamb survival workshops in the past from the Making More From Sheephead uh, uh, banner, which um, which came off fairly well. So we, uh, yeah. but they obviously yeah. were, uh, well, probably only covered about 50 people. So we. Yeah, I think that the absolutely critical thing um, in assessing lamb losses, believe it or not, is simply weighing um, sheep. Uh, dead lambs and just getting an idea of what the weight of your lambs are. If there's only one thing you do, you don't need to post-mortem, you don't need to do anything else other than um, have a look at the weight of the lambs. While you're doing that, you can also have a look. It's very easy to see whether a lamb's walked or whether it hasn't walked and that gives you a bit of an idea um, of whether it's just been from some underfeeding or whether the lambs have got too light um, in utero um, or whether it's straight exposure. So that can give you a, a reasonable idea of what's going on. And at least without a solution, give you a handle to what you need to be addressing. Thanks, Bruce. Adrian's got a, a, a probably a, a, a large question here. Trace elements and mineral blocks, what's your opinion? We have had problems in our cattle uh, that they've diagnosed through blood testing, but they're wondering about sheep. Um, I, look, it's reasonably easy to uh, assess um, sheep, um, so I'd, I'd be encouraging you to actually assess the sheep as well. But the thing, the, the easy thing to think about nutrition is if it's dry, with one exception, if it's dry as it is now where, where we are and perhaps where you are, the major issue is going to be uh, energy and possibly protein. When it's green, which hopefully is for more months of the year than when it's dry, the major issue is got more likely to be elements and trace elements. So it's in the winter and spring where your trace elements are lowest. Once you know that, then you can say, well, if I look in the winter and spring and my trace element status is okay, then I'm probably going to be all right. Now, when you test for selenium these days, the test they do is called glutathione peroxidase, and it actually measures the amount, it predicts the amount of selenium that was in the system two to three months ago. So if you test in the springtime for selenium, then you can easily um, get an idea of what the late winter low level was. And similarly for something like cobalt or copper, testing at that time, will, will you'll be testing at the lowest time of year. And it's really a matter of landmarking at getting eight or ten um, samples from the lambs is often a very good indicator, blood samples from the lambs um, uh, is often a very good indicator of what's going on um, as far as the selenium status goes. In terms of how you best treat the sheep, um, blocks are good. The, the difficulty with blocks 
if particularly if you're a marginal area, blocks are probably fine. The difficulty with blocks is guaranteeing that every animal uh, gets the treatment. Now, if your your animals are used to blocks and they're all on the treatment, um, they have sufficient salt in the blocks that they generally self-medicate at the right level, um, so they get the intake. But it's particularly important for things like iodine, selenium. They're only important for the animals. They do not make any difference at all to pasture growth. So it's a matter of how you best get into the animals, and then that will depend on your system and whether you treat them. But as I say, these days with selenium, it's pretty simple. Um, I see an enormous amount of cobalt going into animals when they're being injected, most of which I can guarantee you is totally wasted. Um, the cobalt deficient areas are the sandy um, soil areas, mostly around the coast. And the, the difficulty is that cobalt is an essential element. And if you've got cobalt deficiency and you give lambs cobalt, it is dramatic. But unfortunately, it's not at all dramatic if you've got poor lambs and you give them cobalt and they're not cobalt deficient. Um, so they're the major two. As I say with copper, I'm reticent to say too much to a wide audience on copper. Um, because if you're in a copper sufficient area and you give extra copper, you can run into troubles. In terms of calcium and magnesium, which are very important for lambing ewes, um, blocks are, are reasonably good, but if you're in cattle with, and you're worried about grass tetany, they're just not quite reliable enough, um, and a dead cow is a dead cow. So they're my thoughts on it. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, just to help you gauge, um, gauge, your, uh, gauge your answers, we've got another 26 uh, questions in front of us here, so everyone's okay. really engaged. Yeah. That, that's, a good, that's a polite way of saying short answers, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it, no, your, your answers are spot on, uh, but I just thought I'd make that uh, make you aware because I've got it in front of me and, and uh, I know you don't have access to that. So, yeah, plenty. Okay, we'll move along. <laughs> Sorry for those people I'm holding up waiting for your answers. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of good questions and, and some really good answers. Now, a uh, quick question here uh, from Bindi. Bindi asks, is there any effect of a flush of green feed or bad weather during joining? Uh, yes, uh, um, both the flush of, a flush of green feed is particularly useful. Uh, Michael Friend and Susan Robertson here have shown that uh, seven days before um, a ewe is mated and two or three days after a ewe is mated, uh, access to green feed can really help. Um, and it needn't be a lot of green feed. It's as little as three to 400 kilograms. So if you're joining sheep, um, it's not the flushing effect of getting the body weight up. There is an additional effect of uh, giving them access to green feed for a short period of time. So if you've got a bit of green feed from a bit of summer rain and you can put those ewes on it, even for the first fortnight that you join, you're probably going to get a response. I, uh, a storm is not too much of a problem. Rain's definitely not a problem during joining, but heat is. And heat stress is a real problem during joining. And we see repeatedly years when we get very hot weeks of weather, um, 40 degrees during joining, that uh, rates are repeatedly lower than, reliably lower than, than in um, milder seasons. And that is both probably an activity effect and an, and an effect on semen quality. Um, so uh, how much effect it has on the ewes uh, is difficult to, to know. The other bit of documented evidence on that is if you shear ewes in the middle of joining, you will stop their ovulation for at least two to three days. The stress of being shedded and shorn does disrupt them. So all of that information says to me, by all means go out, look at your sheep, feed them, um, but don't do major operations in the middle of joining and make sure they've got plenty of access to shade. Great, thanks Bruce. Bruce, a quick comment here from James. He said he'll probably use the Vibrio vaccine. Um, yep. So that was just a comment, um, and a, but a question here from Adam. Uh, can you comment on the role of vitamins in improving immunity or ability to fight particular diseases? Uh, they've had uh, issues in particular with mastitis in the past. Um, no, I, I probably can't make much comment on that. The, the one in terms of immunity that we have done a fair bit of work with is vitamin E and selenium. And um, they certainly um, not only are involved in the specific syndrome of white muscle disease, but they're also involved with um, the general health of the animal. And animals that are marginal in selenium are much more likely to get other problems. And vitamin E seems 
um, reasonably tied up with um, uh, selenium. There's been relatively little work on uh, different vitamins other than um, um, specific issues with the lack of green feed and vitamin A. We're actually um, just setting up to start sampling some flocks for vitamin D, but that's specifically looking about uh, calcium, which in terms of our farming system, calcium is one of our more important elements that um, animals repeatedly run into problems with. Um, and vitamin D plays a role there. But in terms of general immunity, um, I'm not aware of, of a, a lot of work that says one way or the other which way to go with vitamins on that. So I'm sorry about that. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, uh, if you have maidens due to lamb in four weeks' time, Nick wanted to know if you should still treat with the vaccine or is it too late now? I'm not sure what vaccine Nick's referring to there. but He's talking about the Vibrio vaccine and it is too late. Um, so um, apologies, Nick, that we've run the seminar now, um, but at least you can be thinking about it for next year and you can observe what happens this year. But what, what you've got to do, Nick, is you've got to give two doses, um, a minimum of three weeks apart. Um, and David, I think they were lambing in four weeks, were they? Yeah, four weeks. In, in four weeks. And the um, and then then they've got a, another ten days, so it's actually four weeks before they gain immunity. By which time they will have started lambing, and um, any issues probably been and gone. So this year the horse is bolted, and hopefully Nick, you don't have any problems at all. And I've just been scaremongering, um, but next year you can be thinking about it. And certainly, if you see an aborted lamb, it may be of interest to actually find out um, what it, um, what's the cause. Uh, Bruce, a follow-on question here, same thing. How far out from mating do you use a Vibrio vaccine and do adult sheep need to be boosted or is there enough challenge out there from James? Yeah. Great, great question. So, uh, the, look, the important thing is that the sheep that are three months pregnant um, have immunity. Uh, you must give two doses uh, to sheep that haven't been vaccinated for at least three weeks apart. Apart from that, you can do it whenever you like. Now, I've just said you don't want to be getting news in and handling them specifically during joining. So you either do it um, uh, six weeks before joining and then two weeks before joining, something like that, or you do it prior to joining, a couple of weeks before joining, and then you do it immediately after joining. For that trial work that we did at Holbrook, we vaccinated all those flocks two weeks prior to joining and immediately the rams came out. Um, so that's how we did that trial work. The packets these days actually say give both before joining, but the logic behind it is either b before joining, both shots before joining, or one before and one after. Um, there was another issue there that I hadn't addressed. What was the second part of that, David? Because it was important. The second part of that, uh, is there enough challenge out there? Or do you no have to... That, that's that's very important. I, I have glibly uh, given everyone what I think is the minimum. What is actually recommended and what I should be recommending is that then once you've vaccinated those um, maiden sheep, either you're rising one-year-old or you're rising two-year-olds, you then give annual vaccination. I'm, I've seen no evidence that, and given the general, genuine, fairly widespread nature of Campylobacter, I am punting, but I'm saying it out of ignorance, and somebody, if somebody was listening from Coopers, they could certainly jump, challenge me and say I'm not telling the truth. Um, yeah, but it's, so this is just my opinion. I would expect that in adult sheep there's probably been enough challenge. Once they've been in a lambing paddock for a year, uh, well, over a six or eight week period, if there's any Campylobacter around, they've almost certainly been exposed to it, and that will boost their immunity if they've already been vaccinated before. So. Uh, the proper recommendation is two doses uh, as the first time they lamb as maidens and then annual boosters. I'm suggesting um, that at least if producers start thinking about two doses, that's a good start. Um, and whether or not annual boost is necessary, I'm not sure. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, Jonathan had an outbreak of pneumonia after cage dipping wiener lambs. Now, is there a prevention and is there treatment for this? There's not actually available in Australia uh, any um, vaccines for pneumonia. 
There is actually one for arthritis, which is quite common post-dipping, but there is not one for pneumonia. Um, the only uh, hope is that um, I'm hoping that he was cage dipping for, for lice and that he's got rid of it and that he doesn't need to be doing it again. Um, it is definitely a risk with lice. It's particularly a risk um, following a dry, dusty weather because sheep are already uh, pre-exposed. The treatment of individual animals, individual animals can always be treated with antibiotics and they may or may not recover. The difficulty is with the pneumonias is that he will have almost certainly lost some, but the ones that have recovered will uh, actually have lower growth rates um, and depending on the percentage of lung damage um, are unlikely to be good animals to be keeping on for a long period of time. Um, so that's not particularly um, um, encouraging, um, but generally where there's been major outbreaks of pneumonia, you're probably looking at trying to sell those sheep sooner rather than later. Some of them, of course, won't have been affected, and they're quite all right, but you can't determine which ones have been which have been affected. Um, the, the unaffected one, the affected ones um, will appear normal until they're either stressed or something else happens and they get a recurrence of it, but generally speaking, their growth rates will be lower as well. Great, thanks Bruce. Bruce, we're keeping everyone fairly well on board here. We've only lost a, a handful of people that had to duck off, but look, just give Bruce a, just giving Bruce a break there for a second. Um, don't forget that survey. Once you shut down the, uh, the webinar platform, it should pop up automatically. Just give us a few comments there on, on ways that you can, we can improve the, uh, improve the webinar, and if, and if you liked it, let us know as well. Um, now, Bruce, we've still got a bit. I'm actually really, I'm actually really annoyed, David. I told, uh, I had some students with me today, and I told them they didn't have to listen to the webinar because I told them all about abortion. Um, this would have been brilliant for the students. This is like a, a, the vibe that they get at the end of the year, a <laughs> Spanish Inquisition. So I'm sorry I didn't have some students here. Well, if you've got any really, if you've got any handy students, then maybe they'll be delivering the webinar for one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we've still got a few questions to get through here. Uh, I think we've, we may have covered off on this, Bruce, but I'll just ask it again for, for, for thoroughness. Uh, how do I assess animal trace, uh, my animal's trace element status? Yeah, so, so the best way to assess your animal trace element status is to get blood samples um, from either young sheep or lambs in the spring period. And so if you happen to be a, sort of a winter spring lambing and you're lamb marking um, sheep um, and perhaps you're using a gas detailer and perhaps there's uh, seven or eight or ten lambs that you can put a blood tube under and actually get a little bit of uh, blood from and just cut their tails off instead um, and do that in conjunction with your um, local vet um, that's a good way of doing it. Of course, you can always get your vet out to, to get some samples. Um, but generally, the young growing lambs will show up if there's any problems um, in your flock. If they've got good levels, that means the ewes had good levels, and that means they're going to continue to have good levels. And of course, you need to take those samples before you give them a vaccine that might have selenium in it or anything else as well. Um, when I say before, I mean obviously at the same time, um, but you don't want to take it at weaning time when you've then treated sheep with things at um, lamb marking time. And that will, that will assess uh, copper, cobalt and selenium. Um, iodine is actually very hard to assess and really the only way we assess that is by diagnosing goiter and then implementing um, monitoring programs on it. There are technical ways to do it, but it's quite expensive um, and not easily done. Um, and I guess they're the main trace elements that we'd be looking at. Yeah, for sure, Bruce. Now, Brad uh, had a question. He, he he had goiter lambs at birth, and Brad said he missed the presentation, but he had goiter lambs at birth. What is the best method for treatment? So, so specifically for those for the lambs, you can treat the lambs also with the potassium iodide, and they should get a, a treatment. Um, but the main treatment is. Um, if the season or conditions um, are going to repeat themselves and it's, it's because of the region you're in, you really should be treating the ewes um, with 280 milligrams of potassium iodide uh, in about the third or fourth uh, month of pregnancy. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Bruce, a uh, question here from Marie. Would you recommend you move your hay rolls every time you feed it out to a different area in the paddock? 
Uh, would I recommend um, feeding out hay rolls? Anything I feed out, uh, feeders are different because they're not eating off the ground, but anything where animals are eating off the ground, I would be recommending feeding in a different spot each time because the general pattern is that animals um, come into the feed, uh, they sometimes defecate when they come in, they certainly eat a fair bit, then they'll often go off for a drink and come back and when they come back they'll often defecate or they'll defecate while they're around the feed. Um, none of which matters, um, but if you do that uh, week in and week out, you're creating an area where the animals are being forced to ingest more faeces than they would normally do. Interestingly, even though you see sheep um, sitting in sheep camps with lots of manure around, they never graze in those sheep camps and they're actually very hygienic. It's only when we force them to eat where they're standing in the mob grazing situation or when we force them to eat in the trail feeding situation, which I do regularly, um, is that we're creating these conditions which are less uh, hygienic for them. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, so I do know some people who feed out between pegs on their paddock so they know exactly how much they're feeding out the same spot each time. But I personally think it's much better to choose a clean piece of, of ground each time when you're feeding out. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, now a comment here from uh, there's a chap, we made a few comments about the iodine um, uh, or supplements or, 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 or injections from New Zealand. Uh, thanks Bruce, not sure why it is a vet only product in New Zealand. My vet gives me pot, potidium iodine uh, but found two doses needed some years. Kiwis are doing more research now as they're expecting cattle issues now that their brassica, brazen, uh, brassica grazing is so common. So that was a comment from, yeah. from another Bruce. Yeah, good good comment Bruce. That, that's, exactly, that's exactly right and uh, the, the brassicas um, are certainly a risk with the, um, with the ID. Okay, great, thanks. Now, uh, a good comment here, does offering iodized salt lick help with iodine deficiency? Yes, it does. Um, the, the thing I'm actually not aware of is actually how much iodine is in there. Where the, most of the block products have sufficient in there for the major issues, but for the minor issues they throw in extra things to say that they've got them in it, but they're not at sufficient levels to overcome deficiencies. So I would actually have to have a look, or, or the, the person interested could have a look and work out in a dose how much a sheep would get and then over a period of, of three to four weeks whether that would be even close to what you'd give as an oral dose of 280 milligrams. So that's how you have to work it out. Um, but there's no magic in any of this. It's simply a matter of getting iodine in because if we're drenching them we're only wanting to handle them once we give them a higher dose. So they don't need 280 milligrams a day every day. They just need a total of 280 milligrams over a, a period of four to six weeks. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, I'm never cease to amaze me how you have these, uh, you know, these this amount of knowledge coming uh, coming from the, when you're shooting from the hip. But very good answer to a very, very good question. Now, uh, one of our participants here has heeded my request for for context. Now, uh, Eric's ewes have sore feet around lambing. July drop lambs and early uh, at foot lambs. So when they're around lambing or when lambs are fit. Soil is wet from July from June to August, which is when the lameness occurs there in Western Australia, Great Southern Area. What might be the best form of control from Eric? Oh, gee, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're good on you, Eric. That's a great question. Um, I can't possibly answer it. Um, Eric, it, it sounds most likely, provided you're not getting foot abscess, it's most likely that you're getting ovine interdigital dermatitis. A few of the New South Wales people listening to me thinking he's not prepared to say foot rot. But what is, what is very common is it, where sheep are in wet pastures, and I mean when you get your boots wet when you go out at 7 o'clock in the morning and you, there's dew on them again or at 10 o'clock in the morning and the dew's there all night, then those sheep are walking around in, in wet conditions. That wet conditions macerates and um, makes it susceptible, the interdigital skin in between the claws of the foot. 
and that allows a bug called Fusobacterium necrophorum to get in and causes lameness and redness between the toes. It does self-cure once it dries out, but if you're in July, August, it's going to be a long while till it self-cures. The Fusobacterium necrophorum lives in the gut of the sheep, so it's present on every place. Um, in fact, they did a trial about 40 years ago by putting bags on the back of sheep um, to collect their faeces and they stood them in water for three months and while they collected those bags, the sheep never got lame. As soon as they let the bags go and the faeces dropped in the water, they immediately developed OID and that's how they discovered it. It, it responds extremely well to foot bathing, um, but of course with lambs at foot, it's very difficult to foot bathe and foot bathing is only preventative for around about a week. So um, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, it, is, it is possible, uh, but I doubt it, it's possible that it's more severe than OID, which would be uh, a form of foot rot. Um, and again, uh, in Western Australia, treatment of that is, is quite difficult. Uh, vaccine is not allowed, and even in, in uh, Eastern states, vaccine is, is difficult um, or problematic at the moment. Um, we're hoping that'll change in five or six years, but at the moment that's quite um, a problem. So hopefully that gives you an understanding. Um, it will occur in, in wet conditions. Uh, if the sheep have access to a drier area on the, the, the farm where they camp with a bit of a hill and a paddock, they generally aren't as bad as the paddocks that are low-lying and fairly flat. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce. Um, I can give you a break here because we've had a bit of uh, a contribution from another vet, uh, the local district veterinarian in Wagga Wagga, Tim Biffin. Now, Tim's just made a comment here for the um, you know, for the interest of the of the rest of the audience. Now, just for those producers that do find concerns re Campobacter, Tim's found that blood testing from the blood is relatively easy to organise and available through. Um, a certain set of laboratories. I won't, uh, I won't uh, be uh, favouring any particular commercial operations here, but talking to your private vet or your district veterinarian at the time of abortion or when you found a, a suspected case of um, infer in an infertility investigation, if they think it's appropriate, they should be able to organise you know, a direct uh, blood test with the lab or in conjunction um, with a... Um, you know, the appropriate commercial uh, uh, organisation to, to get those those tests done. So I think the, the premise of that is that it's easy to test for. If you've got concerns, um, organise your district veterinarian to come out, have a look, and if they think it's appropriate, then you'll be able to get some tests done. Now... Yeah, spot on, Tim. Thank, thank you very much. Absolutely spot on. And I think you're being very careful there on labs. I think all the testing is all sewn up, David, so I don't think it really matters. I think there's only one place you can do the testing. No. I could be wrong. Yeah, you might be right, and, and Tim's mentioned I, it. I don't think competition exists at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, no worries. But um, So it shouldn't be hard to find out uh, where the best place is to do it if you talk to your local vet, uh, your local district vet. Yeah, or you, you have to do the testing. You have, Tim's point, which is right, is you have to do the testing through your vet anyway. So you need to get your vet involved to get the testing done. You can't just submit to a lab without a vet. Yep, perfect. Now, a question here from oh, look, let me. Uh, oh, well, question here from Adam. Adam asks, most of which, most of which may have come down to paddock hygiene, but we have tried an ADE vitamin injection prior on use prior to use lambing, and had relatively low numbers of mastitis in the last couple of years. And that must be that was in relation to that previous question of vitamins. Uh, so Adam, yep. the AD yep. vitamin injection prior to lambing. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, we're going to start doing a bit of testing on vitamin D. A and E tend to be problems in um, over the, the summer-autumn period, um, and the levels tend to go back up very quickly when there's any access to green feed. So um, so I'm not... Uh, but specifically with, with lambing difficulties, vitamin D is tied up with calcium, which is what we're concerned about with the ability of sheep, one, to, to um, push the lambs out, and two, in terms of calcium homeostasis. So um, both of those may or may not be relevant. But as I say at the moment, I don't have any additional information on that. Okay, thanks, Bruce. So we've still got about uh, 10 questions in the pipeline here. There's been one or two add-ons since we had the last count. But look, a quick question here from Barry. 
And I'll be interested in what the answer is to this because I think I've got an inkling. Lambs are born with large heads relative to body size. What's the likely cause from Barry? So, so that, that's usually um, a distinctive Barry for dystopia, which means that, that they've had a prolonged birth and the head has come out first of all and then got stuck at the shoulders and it's just edema. And if those lambs survive, and it, it's absolutely surprising that some of them do survive and very well, within 24 hours they're almost um, back to normal. Um, but I think that's probably what Barry's uh, describing. There is a condition in sheep, but it's in adult sheep, and it's, it's nothing what we're talking about here that's called big head. But there's, there's no real condition that caused that other than just normal dystopia. Yep. Okay. Great. Is that what you were thinking, David? Yeah, it was actually. So I've I've given myself a little pat what on the back there. <laughs> it was what you were thinking. Yeah, it was. So I I. I oh, good. So we both get full marks. I'm I'm a far cry from delivering this webinar, but I I did pre preempt one one answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um. So a quick question here from Peter: Does the B does a vitamin B12 added to a vac to vaccine? He hasn't mentioned which vaccine, but does vitamin B12 yeah. added to vaccine yep. increase growth rates in lambs as claimed? Um, yes, yes, it absolutely does if you have cobalt deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency, which occurs in coastal areas in South Australia, in some areas in East, East Gippsland. So I'm not sure where you're from, Peter, um, but it in most cases doesn't do anything at all. We've um, what, look, the only thing I can suggest to people, if you're really interested in this, I would really, really encourage anyone who's vaccinating with something that they think is useful, is just go to the effort to leave 50 of them, at least 50, you can do half and half, but at least 50 of them unvaccinated, or alternatively only um, uh, do 50 of them and actually weigh them and see if there's any difference. Because we repeatedly do these trials and we rarely, if ever, find a difference. Um, where we haven't got a deficiency. Uh, occasionally, just by chance, you know, when you toss uh, coins, you can get eight heads in a row, but it's pretty rare. Um, so occasionally you can pick up a difference and you think it's dramatic, but the more you repeat it, the more you get confident that unless you've got a specific deficiency, just on its own, it doesn't do anything. And I don't know whether anyone saw the ABC program a couple of weeks ago on, on vitamins or, or last week, but it is very much the same. If everything is normal, it just goes straight back out in the urine. The animals don't keep that in their system and then say later on, now I'm deficient, and use it. If it's not needed at the time, they get it straight back out again and it'll be back on your pastures. Thanks, Bruce. Quick question here, simple one. I expect what weight should uh, newborn lambs be? A great question. What, it depends a little bit on the type of sheep you've got. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to get twins up around that four and a half kilogram and you're trying to keep singles under about the five and a half kilogram. Once animals get below about four kilograms, you're getting into trouble. And why I suggest to people that they weigh them, often you'll find your twins might be at two and a half or three kilos. They've got very little chance of survival. They will survive on a, if they're born at 10 o'clock on a sunny morning and they've got a very good mother, but it's asking for a lot to happen all at once. So between that four, sometimes up to six kilos with some breeds, some genotypes of sheep can still be all right. Once you're getting over the six and certainly in the seven, you're into dystopia problems in your singles. So it's around that four to five kilos ideal. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Um, would Bruce agree that there are conception gains by addressing iodine deficiency prior to joining? Um, I'm not actually aware of that, so I can't comment on that. That sounds like that person actually has some information on it. Um, inherently, I would say that if there's a, a real iodine deficiency, um, given its importance for everything it, it does, um, it would make sense to keep it up. My experience with iodine deficiency is probably more limited than that. I've only been involved mostly with um, goiter and lamb losses rather than an overall iodine deficiency. So I'm not, I'm not aware of information anywhere that says that reproductive performance is improved, but having said that, it's logical that if sheep are really deficient, um, they could be. However, 
to get sheep really deficient, even sheep with goiter, the sheep aren't particularly deficient till they get to that big draw as the lamb's growing very rapidly. Um, and so that's where your real deficiency come and when, when that coincides with the late winter, early spring period, that's when we see the problems. So even on some of these farms where they've had problems with goiter, at other times of the year, we don't see deficiencies in those ewes. But if you've got a deficiency all year round, um, and it would be much more common in a, in a uh, say in, in southern Victoria, somewhere that would stay green for a lot longer of the year. In the area I've mostly worked in, the dry summer really brings us back to speed with a lot of our minerals, and then we go back into deficiencies in the winter. Great, thank you, Bruce. Bruce, now Peter asks, is hair and wool analysis a reliable way to test for mineral deficiencies in sheep and goats? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, there's a couple of things you can test on hair. Um, you can, and you can examine hair, particularly in sheep for steely wool, um, but hair testing um, isn't um, uh, sufficient uh, or robust enough for picking up um, small differences. The, the, the thing that you're looking, if you're looking for a deficiency and you've got a real problem, you can diagnose across almost anything. But what we're often looking for on most properties is seeing the, where the level is and whether it's marginal or not. And we're mostly looking, believe it or not, for subclinical problems, which is where you don't really see any of the, the, the classic white muscle disease or anything, but where you still get a small production response by having those trace elements present. Um, so in that case, um, we need to know exactly what those levels are. And, and to my knowledge, blood testing is um, more accurate. The, the exception to that, of course, is with copper, where the most accurate way of assessing copper is actually through livers. Um, and we sometimes get producers to actually collect sheep livers over a three or, month, three or four month period um, and then get them analysed. You know, they collect the livers from sheep uh, on their farm and put them in the freezer and then we collect them. And in New Zealand, we used to do, particularly in cattle, but also in sheep liver biopsies on a regular basis to get a better feel. But for what most people um, want to know in the Australian situation, uh, just getting blood coppers initially is a very good starting point. Uh, and certainly for selenium, the beauty of selenium is it's not particularly variable, so you don't need many samples with selenium to get it. Cobalt is more variable. Um, but I would suggest that it's probably less efficient than most of the other ones, so it's less of a problem. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks. That's great. Um, I, I, should, I should also just add to people who are concerned about selenium, although as I keep on saying, it's now in the drenches and we're using a fair bit of selenium in drenches. There's enough um, selenium in, a, um, in the um, vaccine that you use, which has got a six in one plus selenium, for an 11 kilogram lamb. So if you're treating 20 kilogram lambs, they're only getting a half dose of selenium. Okay, well that's helpful to know, thank you. There's a question here uh, from Michael. He's got his lambing in a feedlot. Um, they have ample nutrition. Uh, any reason for small lambs in singles as well? Um, he's lambing in a feedlot. Um, the, the question is what the nutrition was in the um, second to third trimester. So, so what happens with, with sheep is that in the first uh, trimester, there's development of the embryo, but there's not much development of the placenta and there's not much growth of the fetus. In the middle trimester, there's enormous growth, growth of the placenta. And if you get a severe restriction during the middle part of pregnancy, the size of the placenta can be restricted. So even then you, you give them adequate nutrition in the last trimester, the, the third part of pregnancy, the restricted placenta doesn't allow the lamb to grow um, to a big enough size. So if there was a lot of restriction on the sheep in the um, middle part when the placenta was going, that can lead to small lambs. The other, the other thing that can happen for other people is that the middle um, trimester, they're okay, and so the placenta goes all right, but then there's insufficient um, feed at the 
end of um, trimester, given that a, a, a ewe in the last six weeks needs about 60% additional energy than a dry ewe and her intake doesn't go up at all. In fact, it almost, uh, depending on the type of feed, her intake can be slightly lower than a dry sheep because of the effect of the, um, particularly with twins. So it's very important that the energy density goes up towards the end of, of um, um, coming up to lambing, which is why we rarely recommend something like hay at the, um, in lambing, whereas once ewes are lactating, their appetite actually goes up and something like hay with its fibre helps enormously with milk production. Um, whereas something like wheat, while they're actually got lambs at foot, will lead to a better body condition of use but poorer milk production because there's not enough fibre for the, the milk. Is that, that might be all a bit too much information, but that's just a bit of an overview. No. So that may be the problem. In terms of specific diseases, I can't think of anything that causes just small lambs. Normally with diseases, you get a range of weak lambs, aborted lambs, and often the odd abnormal lamb, looking lamb. Thanks, Bruce. Now, Bruce, this might be more of a systems-based question, so um, I'll let you consider it. If heat stress affects joining, when can you join use again if scammed empty? Uh, right. That's, uh, right. So I'm guessing these years were probably joined in December, um, maybe November, December. Um, they've been scanned at the um, middle of February and we've got some news. The, the issue with heat stress is you join whenever it suits you to join. If, if I wasn't looking at a farm, which would be pretty pointless, and I was only looking at the ewes and I wanted maximum fertility out of my ewes, I would be joining them in April every year. But I don't join my own ewes. Uh, I start joining them in, in March, which is slightly early. Um, but it's not as hot in terms of the rams. But the optimal fertility of the sheep, because they're short uh, season breeders, uh, will be around that um, mid-April um, period. So that's when you're going to get the best result. But of course that produces your lambs in the middle of September, early October. If you're running out of feed at that stage, you end up weaning light lambs onto uh, no feed at all and then you've got other problems. So uh, horses for courses. What I, what I was warning people about was um, we can't get everything we want. So if the temperature is 40 degrees, your reproductive performance won't be as good. Ironically, I, we don't join sheep um, in the winter, but ironically I've, I've seen the same thing with cattle um, in very cold conditions, generally don't join quite as well. And, and I remember a couple of people running AI programs around Holbrook said you could really tell what the weather had been doing by the cycling of the, the cattle in the winter time. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Bruce, we're down to our last um, three questions. One of Mitch may have been covered uh, already, so potentially two, but let's have, a, let's have a crack here. Ivan Capel told me that selenium and drench was next or to useless and to put a bullet in or depot, depot product. I see a bit of white muscle and I suspect I get a response in wool cut alone to the bullets. He think he seems to think there is also a relationship with fertility through glucose metabolism. So I apologise for that sound yeah. a bit disjointed, but uh, that's what no, no, I got. I got all that and he's absolutely spot on. And I know a lot of my knowledge on this from Ivan Capel, who I worked with for three years. Um, so I'm not about to disagree with Ivan, even though I love disagreeing with him. Um, it's absolutely spot on. The difference, the difference is, and when Ivan gave him that advice, there actually wasn't selenium added into the drench. And what Ivan was talking about, what he was very big was on people trying to mix up selenium and giving it to sheep. They rarely gave it to sheep because of the, the you know, they forgot to do it or didn't. Whereas if you get a bullet, it's in there and happening. If you're in a selenium deficient place and you're down somewhere where you might have been talking to Ivan using a, a bullet, a, a long-term solution is a very, very good option. So I have no troubles. And I haven't, uh, I apologise, but I haven't tried to talk about trace elements tonight. I've touched mainly on iodine and just mentioned the others and we've sort of strayed into that because Ivan will actually agree 100% with me that the reproductive changes aren't great with selenium and we're not really sure about them. It makes sense that they might have something to do with it. 
And what it always makes sense is that if you've got animals deficient, you should be addressing that deficiency. The difficulty both Ivan and I have is we see a lot of people using trace elements that don't need it um, and thinking that will be the solution to problems which are other nutritional or, or management problems. So is, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Thanks, Bruce. That's good. Um, that's really good. Now, Bruce, quick question here. A lot of heliotrope in our pastures there at the Forbes area. This is from Terry. Oh, so yep. any, any signs to look out for on the U uh, to indicate that they've been receiving too much heliotrope? Terry. Uh, only, only two things that you can really look out for. Heliotrope causes two problems. It's a primary liver toxin, so it's everything you get with um, the liver not working as well. So it's sheep failing to gain weight, uh, occasionally a bit of jaundice. But the other thing you really have to watch out for, particularly um, if you hit a, a good clover um, stretch, if you've got a really good autumn break and suddenly your clover's there, is they're the ones that can get the copper toxicity. And what happens is that the damage to the liver causes copper to um, flow out of the system and they suddenly get a hemolytic crisis from too much copper. Um, so they're the two things. One's a sudden death and the uh, animals are very, very yellow under the skin. The other's just more um, animals just failing to um, be doing as well as you'd expect them to be doing. And that's the difficulty with liver. You can, of course, get your um, vet out and they can do uh, blood samples and that will give you an idea of the health of the liver. There's two enzymes that we regularly test and can give you a good idea of how much damage has occurred. Uh, I'd be looking at sampling five to ten um, just normal animals and having a look at their liver enzymes would give you a good idea. Okay, well, thanks Bruce. Now this is a question from me. Is there photosensitivity issues with heliotrope is that, or is that what you're referring to with the yellowness? So photosensitization, no, it is, is um, uh, occurs uh, occasionally but isn't as much of a feature as just the primary liver disease. Anything that gives um, the sort of liver disease that you get um, from heliotrope can cause a secondary photosensitization. So you can get that. Um, but um, generally it's more the ill thrift you see. The yellowness was from all the blood being broken down and then um, it's a jaundice under the skin that you get with, the, with the acute copper toxicity. Great, right now, thank you. Now, Bruce, lucky last question. Now we've probably we've been across this one part of it, but I'll, for thoroughness, we'll just we'll, we'll knock it over. Bruce mentioned weighing dead lambs. What is the body weight threshold he looks for as a rule for general uh, uh, to look out for to determine general underfeeding in late pregnancy, or that something more sinister is at play? Uh, so I guess the the when you say something more sinister. I'm probably not looking at the weight of lambs for something more sinister. I'm probably only looking at the nutrition of the ewes. When I'm looking for more sinister things, I'm really looking for um, abnormal lambs or aborted lambs or um, uh, weak lambs that have some sort of abnormality to them as opposed to just light lambs. So the threshold I'm looking for is around that four to four and a half kilos. If sheep are getting below the four kilo mark, I'm starting to be concerned that that's going to be increasing the deaths in the flock and that might have been due to some undernutrition. And if the singles are getting over around about six kilos, depending on the type, I'm mostly talking about reasonable frame merinos here. Obviously crossbreds are slightly, um, well, a fair bit heavier, um, uh, probably another kilo for the, the crossbreds. Um, that gives me a good indication of what's going on. You've got to weigh probably um, 15 to 20 lambs minimum to start to get an idea of what the birth weight is. And of course we tend to weigh the dead ones, um, which might be the light and the heavy. So you have to sort of take a bit of an idea and, and occasionally it's worthwhile just um, weighing a, a normal lamb just as it's born um, and just seeing what the, what the weight is to give you some idea of all the ones that are running around. Oh, yeah, thanks, Bruce. You wouldn't believe it. I've got a, uh, I've got a question here come in on email. Uh, it seems to be a good question, so I suspect we should cover it. Now, while you're answering it, I might run down and check my, uh, check my mailbox and see if I've got any questions in there for you as well. But um, <laughs> look, a question from John. Do sheep get immunity for toxo from each other? 
i.e. running young ewes or lambs with older sheep from John? Oh, great question. Um, I mean, instinctively you say yes, but the answer is actually no. They don't get immunity from each other. They get immunity um, for themselves um, when they get exposed to it, but the only way that sheep get immunity is to get exposed to it via the cats. Um, so they're getting immunity from the cats, but not from each other. So running, unlike with the Campylobacter, running young ewes with older ewes with Toxo isn't going to be useful because they're not shedding anything that any antigens that, that could then expose the, the ewes. I hope, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yes, thank you, thank you. No, it does. And um, let's... Well, uh, I, I also, I had a good... Um, there is on the... Um, um, probably making more from wool website, or it's possibly also on the Lifetime U, it's definitely on the Lifetime U management website. There is a very good graph um, from Lifetime U. If you Google Lifetime U and look up lamb birth weights, um, there's a very good graph that shows the, um, the, the typical weights that you're looking for if anyone's interested. I should have put that up on my screen, but I, sorry, I was too busy concentrating on answering questions and fiddling around with the computer. Yeah, no, no dramas, Bruce. But oh, I think I think you've given a very thorough explanation of the lamb birth weight. Uh, you know the scenarios that will play out for different different weight lambs at birth. There. Now, look, we've run out of questions. Um, it's been a mar marathon effort. Thank you. Pleasure. We've we've stayed a fair way from um, reproduction, but I'm pretty happy with that. So. <laughs> yes. No worries at all. It's all been worthwhile, and you know we're answering. Uh, questions that people were, you know, they're dealing with in their own businesses. So I think that's, um, you know, that's what we advertise and that's what we need to deliver on. So I appreciate your time and effort in that. And I think even though you're not getting the uh, feedback at your end, I'm getting quite a few thank yous in my message pane here. So uh, you might not be right. able to hear or see the participants. I know it's a bit of a, um, it can be a bit disconcerting, but I'm getting the thank yous and text here and uh, passing them on to you. And I. I'd imagine that had we had the opportunity, there'd be a collective round of applause for for an hour, hour and a half of uh, good, solid information. So um, with that, Bruce, I think we should wrap it up. For those who are still online, yep, no, there's, um, yep, and there's more thank yous coming through here from a range of people, James, Nicole, Gabrielle. Thanks, guys, for that. Now, we're going to wrap up. Don't forget that uh, on March the 15th, we've got the pasture webinar, so we're looking at where our best investment or the best returns are going to come with regards to investing in the pastures in the uh, in the year ahead. And on March 22, we've got an interesting webinar on, you know, the current uh, wool quality discounts in, 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 in wool. And we've got a very good bloke on board with that, Andrew Woods from Independent Commodity oh. Services. Uh, now, You've Andrew, got two very good speakers coming up there, David. Yeah. You've, and, you've got Two best on those subjects. <laughs> well, that's what I like to think, and um, I know I know Andrew very well. I worked in the office with him for a while, and he's the uh, he's the go-to man for any wool marketing information, and um, he's been great to us at helping helping us out, helping me out, and he also does a lot of work. And um, yeah, so if you pick up a wool report anywhere, whether it comes from your local retail, uh, you know, rural rural reseller or whatever, there's a good chance that uh, Andrew may have been behind some of the analysis gone into that full report. So looking forward to that. Um, Bruce, once again, thank you so much uh, from, you know, on behalf of the audience, on behalf of myself, uh, you provided a great webinar. And, and thank you very much on behalf of the audience for turning up tonight and supporting this uh, Making More From Sheep activity on uh, 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 MLA and AWI program. We're looking forward to running a lot more webinars in the future. And we like to encourage people to attend the live webinars because once you attend, you get to participate in this Q&A session and you're also yeah. showing MLA that you're interested or and AWI that you're interested and that they're, they're putting their levies in the right spot. So once again, thank you very much for that. So let's leave it at that. Um, have a crack okay. at it. Okay, I'll say good night and thank you. They were great questions. So thanks, David. Night, night. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Cheers. Have a good evening. And um, Thank you for that on, on behalf of Bruce. Thanks for everyone for listening and asking some great questions. So have a good evening. Have a crack at that survey when you leave and we'll see you on March 15th.